Hello, it's Eric from Strong Medicine. Today I'll be giving a demonstration of an oral presentation of a medical HMP. In fact, I'll be giving two demonstrations of the same case. The first will be a relatively detailed so-called complete HMP that I would expect of a clerkship student on a service that was not unusually busy. It's common for this form of the presentation to be called the seven minute presentation, though in practice, it's not unreasonable for a student presentation on a complicated patient to be as long as 10 minutes, but try to avoid going beyond this. The second demonstration will be a much more concise form of presentation of the same patient. This is more representative of the presentation that I would expect from a seasoned resident for whom I would not necessarily need every detail or aspect of their reasoning spelled out. Or for an intern or sub I who was on an unusually busy team for which the presentation of a complete HMP is just not practical. A commonly cited time limit for this version of the presentation is three minutes. While watching the second demo, make note of how I successfully trimmed the time by more than 50% by cutting details that are redundant or which don't significantly contribute to the differential diagnosis, by using shortened forms of words, and in particular, by eliminating most commentary. The primary source of information is the patient who appears reliable. The chief complaint, Ms. Harris is a 76-year-old woman with a history of hypertension and an MI three years ago who presents with dyspnea for two weeks. Ms. Harris uh, reported being in her usual state of health until three weeks ago, at which time she noted the onset of some swelling in her feet. The swelling appeared symmetric and was not associated with pain or redness. Then two weeks ago, she began noting some shortness of breath with exertion. It started off mild, only noting it when, uh, when walking relatively long distances, such as shopping at the local mall. However, it progressively worsened with less and less amount of exertion necessary to trigger it. She now feels short of breath walking around uh, between rooms in her home, and she needed to stop twice when walking from her car uh, in the parking lot to the entrance of the emergency room. She also thinks her leg swelling has been worsening. She reported uh, no orthopnea or PND, uh, no chest, arm, or abdominal pain, uh, no palpitations or lightheadedness, and uh, no nausea or vomiting. When asked about her perspective on her illness, Ms. Harris is concerned that she is having another heart attack. Moving to her past medical history, she had an end STEMI in 2021. She received a PCI and drug-eluting stent to her mid-LAD at that time. She has had hypertension for about 20 years, which she believes is well controlled with a typical home blood pressure of 130s over 80s. She has osteoarthritis of both knees and occasional GERD. Uh, no relevant past surgical, obstetric, or psychiatric history. She reported a remote history of a rash to an antibiotic taken for a UTI, but did not remember the name. Her current outpatient medications include uh, aspirin 81 daily, atorvastatin 40 daily, lisinopril 40 daily, and lodipine 5 daily, ibuprofen PRN, uh, predominantly for knee pain, and calcium carbonate or Tums PRN for uh, her GERD. She reports missing less than one dose of her meds per month. She takes no supplements or herbals. For social history, she has never smoked uh, and only drinks alcohol a few times a year for special occasions. She has no history of illicit drug use. She lives with her husband in a one-story home in the South Bay. For her diet, she prepares most meals for her and her husband and deliberately tries to limit the amount of added salt because of her hypertension. Family history is notable for her father who suffered a fatal MI at the age of 80. Review of systems is unremarkable aside from what has been previously mentioned. Moving to her physical exam, her temperature was 97.4, her pulse was 126, her blood pressure was 136 over 72, respiratory rate 24, and O2 sat 96% on 2 liters. She appeared to her state of age and looked comfortable while at 45 degrees in the ER gurney. Her cardiovascular exam was notable for an irregularly irregular heart rhythm with otherwise normal carotid, DP, and PT pulses bilaterally. No murmurs or gallops, and JVP was elevated with the presence of abdominal jugular reflux. She had mild symmetric bibasilar crackles. Abdomen was non-distended. 
On extremity exam, they were warm with no cyanosis, and she had moderate symmetric pitting edema to the upper shins. On neuro exam, she was fully awake and oriented. Speech and language were normal. With gait assessment, she was slow but steady with conventional gait, but became excessively winded after about 20 feet, with a starting O2 sat of 93% on rumea that dropped down to 86%. Bedside pocus showed reduced LV function with a dilated and non-collapsing IBC and multiple diffuse bilateral B lines. On labs, CBC and chemistry panels were unremarkable with a creatinine of 1.1, which is within her baseline of 0.9 to 1.2. Her troponin was normal. A BNP was 1100. ECG showed atrial fibrillation at 120 beats per minute with a normal QRS axis uh, and no ST or T changes. Chest X-ray showed normal cardiac silhouette with trace bilateral effusions and moderate symmetric pulmonary edema. In the ER prior to my evaluation, Ms. Harris had, order, uh, had order, already received 40 milligrams of IV furosemide, the subsequent 400 milliliters of urine output, and she had received 5 milligrams of IV metoprolol with minimal apparent effect on her heart rate. In summary, Ms. Harris is a 76-year-old woman with a history of hypertension and prior MI who is presenting with subacute progressive dyspnea and symmetric lower extremity edema. Her exam and diagnostic data is most notable for the presence of volume overload, elevated BNP, normal troponin, atrial fibrillation on ECG, and reduced LV systolic function on POCUS. Regarding her differential diagnosis, the evidence that she has acute decompensated heart failure is definitive enough to consider the syndrome ruled in, but we now must determine its underlying cause. My leading candidate is her new onset AFib, complicated by tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. Another consideration is ischemia or recent MI. This is less likely given the lack of angina or angina equivalence, her normal troponin in the setting of prolonged symptoms, and the lack of ischemic changes on ECG, though ECG is imperfectly sensitive for ischemia. Regarding other explanations for acute heart failure, there are no murmurs on exam, which has a good negative predictive value to uh, rule out hemodynamically significant valvular disease, no history of drug or alcohol abuse, no symptoms or signs of thyroid disease besides the uh, aforementioned AFib, and neither infectious symptoms nor elevated troponin to suggest myocarditis. Problem number one, acute decompensated heart failure. She is hemodynamically stable with the warm and wet subtype. Etiology is likely but not definitively new onset AFib as above. Regarding diagnostics, we will get a formal echocardiogram to get a more precise estimate of EF to definitively rule out valvular disease and to look for focal wall motion abnormalities that might point us more towards ischemia as the underlying etiology. You'll also consult cardiology with a specific question of the choice and best timing of stress testing. Therapeutically, for diuresis, we will continue with IV furosemide 40 mg BID with a goal of one and a half to two and a half liters net negative over the next 24 hours. For afterload reduction, we will continue her lisinopril 40 daily. Although I would not usually start amlodipine in someone with acute heart failure, I'll tentatively plan on continuing her outpatient amlodipine 5 daily for now. And for neurohormonal blockade, given the current acuity, I will hold off on an SGLT2 inhibitor, long-acting beta, uh, beta blocker, or switching her from lisinopril to entresto, though I tentatively anticipate some subset of these changes prior to her discharge. Problem number two, uh, new onset AFib with rapid ventricular response. Given the lack of palpitations, it's possible that she's been in this rhythm for weeks or even longer without knowing it, so we will need to treat her as having a potential left atrial clot until proven otherwise. Diagnostically, another item for our cardiology consultant will be a request for a TEE prior to anticipated cardioversion with choice between electrical versus pharmacologic at their discretion. We will start anticoagulation with anoxaparin, anticipating a switch to apixaban as soon as we've ruled out a need for invasive procedures such as cath. For acute rate control, unfortunately, she has no particularly great options. Metoprolol and deltaism are both contraindicated given the acute heart failure. Amiodarone is contraindicated until we've ruled out a left atrial clot via TEE. 
and a digoxin load is slow to reach effective dose. Given these circumstances, we'll start an esmolol drip as the very short half-life allows us to quickly shut it off if she develops hypotension or signs of low output. Our goal heart rate for the next 24 hours will be conservative at less than 110. Problem number three, uh, CAD, continuing outpatient aspirin and torvastatin. Problem number four, hypertension. As above, we'll continue her outpatient lisinopril and amlodipine, though I anticipate changes to one or both of these meds prior to discharge. Problem number four, osteoarthritis. We'll try a switch from PRN ibuprofen to PRN acetaminophen. Problem number five, GERD. We'll continue her PRN calcium carbonate. Uh, and last, uh, Ms. Harris is full code, and I anticipate she will discharge back to her home once euvolemic on a good heart failure regimen and either in sinus rhythm or with her AFib rate controlled. Ms. Harris is a 76-year-old woman with a history of hypertension and an MI three years ago who presented with dyspnea for two weeks. She was in her usual state of health until three weeks ago, at which time she noted the onset of symmetric, painless feet swelling. Then two weeks ago, she noted the gradual onset of exertional dyspnea, which has progressed to the point of feeling dyspneic while walking around her home. She reports no orthopnea or PND, no chest, arm, or abdominal pain, no palpitations or lightheadedness, and no nausea or vomiting. Ms. Harris herself is concerned she's having another heart attack. PMH includes an NSTEMI in 2021 with PCI to the mid-LAD, hypertension, OA, and GERD. Her outpatient meds include aspirin 81, uh, Atorva 40, lisinopril 40 daily, amlodipine 5 daily, ibuprofen PRN, and calcium carbonate PRN. Social and family history are non-contributory. On exam, pulse was 126, BP 136 over 72, Respiratory rate was 24, and O2 set was 96% on 2 liters. She appeared comfortable. She had an irregularly irregular rhythm, no murmurs or gallops. She had an elevated JVP and mild symmetric bibasilar crackles. Extremities were warm and with moderate symmetric pitting edema. Focus showed reduced LV function with a dilated and non-collapsing IVC and multiple diffuse bilateral B-lines. CBC and chemistry panels were both unremarkable, with normal troponin and a BNP of 1,100. ECG showed AFib at 120 with no ST or T changes. Chest X-ray showed trace effusions and moderate symmetric pulmonary edema. In the ER, she had gotten 40 milligrams of IV Lasix uh, with 400 cc's of output and 5 IV Metope with minimal effect on her heart rate. In summary, Ms. Harris is a 76-year-old woman with a history of hypertension and prior MI, who is presenting with subacute progressive dyspnea and symmetric lower extremity edema. Her uh, she has volume overload on exam and a chest X-ray, an elevated BNP and reduced LV function of POCUS in the setting of rapid AFib, which is all diagnostic of acute decompensator heart failure of the warm and wet subtype. The leading trigger for the new onset AFib is tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, though I would not yet rule out ongoing ischemia or recent MI. Problem number one, acute decompensated heart failure. We have ordered a formal echo and will consult cards for help with determining the choice of modality and best timing of stress testing. Therapeutically, we've started IV furosemide 40 BID with a goal of one and a half to two and a half liters net negative. For afterload reduction, we're continuing her outpatient lisinopril and amlodipine for now. We are holding off on an SGLT2 inhibitor, long-acting beta, uh, beta blocker, or Entresto, though tentatively anticipate some subset of these changes prior to discharge. Problem two, new onset AFib with RVR. Another item for cards will be a request for TEE prior to anticipated cardioversion. We're starting a noxaparin for now, but anticipate switching to a Pixaban in the next few days. For acute rate control, neither Metope, DILT, Amio, nor DIG are great options, so we'll be starting Esmolol with a relatively high goal of a rate less than 110. For CAD, we're continuing her outpatient aspirin and atorva. For hypertension, as above, continuing her lisinopril and amlodipine, for now at least. For OA, if needed, we'll use PRN acetaminophen. For GERD, PRN calcium carbonate, consistent with her outpatient treatment. 
And last, Ms. Harris's full code, and I anticipate she'll be discharged back home.